into space. Listening may not be the best way to describe what we're doing, though, when we're searching the galaxy for potentially habitable planets. Our primary tools use waves in the electromagnetic spectrum, from visible light to radio waves. Even sound waves provide information. The heavens are far from silent. But with all this observational technology, what can we expect to find from another civilization? Peter Worden of Breakthrough Initiatives spoke to us about how we might detect communications that are not our own. Very interesting question how one listens. Uh, you know, that you, you look for an electromagnetic signal, and it's really a misnomer to say that a radio signal is listening. I think it's really a, a historic artifact that, that initially radio was, you know, you transmitted sound, and, and uh, it wasn't until later you transmitted imagery, and, and now we, of course, use frequencies other than radio. We use optical frequencies and so forth. So when we say listen, uh, we are trying to detect an electromagnetic signal which could be a radio wave, it could be a, an optical signal like a laser signal, or it could be some other region of the electromagnetic spectrum, that we would see some modulation of that signal in a way that would indicate uh, ordered or intelligent content. I know as part of our breakthrough listen effort, we're looking at both radio and optical frequencies. So the, the majority of the work is in the radio, but we also have a telescope, the Automated Planet Finder Telescope, uh, two and a half meter telescope at Lick Observatory in California that's looking for laser signals. So increasingly, we're seeing that space communications is, is using light uh, rather than radio waves. I mean, they're, it's all electromagnetic radiation. But one of the things, there, there are two separate kind of concepts that we've looked at. One of those is a message directed at us, which is, you know, a beacon. And of course, there's a lot of discussion about how those beacons would work uh, they're probably based on some mathematics to kind of boot up your knowledge. Uh, the other one is what's called leakage. And what that implies is that you're you're overhearing, you know, some communication that they have for their own purposes. Many might be more familiar with SETI, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. We spoke with senior scientist at SETI, Seth Shostak, about what they're looking for. Yeah, we would look for the kind of transmissions that only could come from a transmitter. I mean, space makes a lot of radio noise. People have heard of things like quasars and pulsars. and But, you know, the sun makes some radio noise. The planets, Jupiter makes a little bit of radio noise. But if you find the kind of signal that transmitters make, you can say, you know, that's not nature. That's, uh, you know, maybe a Klingon broadcasting station. What would it take for a civilization to transmit a signal like this to us here on Earth? Avi Loeb has some thoughts. If we detect artificial signals, signals that are hard to reproduce with natural phenomena, we should contemplate the possibility that they are originating from extraterrestrial civilizations. So just to give you an example, over the past decade, there were very peculiar signals detected from the sky. They are called fast radio bursts. These are brief, uh, millisecond-long bursts of radio waves that we see from many different directions on the sky. And a couple of weeks ago, uh, we were able to identify that they definitely originate from cosmological distances, from outside our galaxy, large distances. But they are extremely bright, much more so than any other source uh, in the radio. They, they have a brightness temperature of, of order of uh, 10 to the power of 37 degrees, which is huge. There are two places where we see such very bright, uh, high brightness temperatures. One is near neutron stars. There are objects called pulsars, where we see bursts of radiation that are extremely bright. Another one is radio antenna, you know, uh, artificially produced uh, signals that we produce with antenna. Uh, they're also extremely bright in the radio uh, because you uh, basically run electrons back and forth in a wire, and that generates very powerful waves. That's how we communicate with radio waves. I decided to write a paper uh, asking the question, you know, with a, with a postdoc, uh, Manas Lingam here at Harvard, asking the question of whether these signals could be artificial in origin. And so we submitted a paper discussing the requirements for a civilization to produce such strong signals at a cosmological distance. And we found that uh, you really need a transmitter as big as, the, as a planet, roughly, to do that. And as Pete Worden explains, scientists are looking for all types of possible transmissions. 
Uh, of course, there's two kinds of signals you could get in space. One would be where somebody is trying to communicate with uh, with us, that they're aiming something directly. The, 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 the second one would be that we were overhearing one of their conversations, if you want to put it that way, or we would just inadvertently detect uh, communication they're making for their own purposes. Uh, one example is they may have planets, uh, several planets in their solar system that they inhabit, and they're communicating between those planets, and we happen to be in the line of sight and are able to see those signals. Of course, if they're not aiming something directly at us, uh, we, we may only have an intermittent capability to de detect it. So we're looking for we're looking at ways that we could search the whole sky for a transient a signal, a signal that only exists maybe for a short period of time. Uh, indeed, the, the the more famous detections of the or, or claim detections in decades past uh, all seem to have been transient. I mean, the most famous one was the uh, the WOW signal in the 1970s. You know, it existed for 30 seconds and then was never seen again. That's the kind of thing that, that we're trying to see. In addition to searching for a signal that's there most of the time, we need to also look over a much broader part of the sky uh, for a transient signal. You know, we're trying to do ultimately a thorough search out to about a thousand light years. So say if we found some star, mm -hmm. you know, 50 or 100 light years away, that, that we saw an evidence of a signal, we then of course would focus a lot more resources on it. Our conversation with Beth Biller kept our hopes in check. In the next decade or two, with the extremely large telescopes that are being built on the ground, uh, and eventually the um, successor actually to JWST, which is sometimes called LUVAR, sometimes called the High Definition Space Telescope, we're gonna start to be able to maybe image planets around other stars. I mean, sorry, low mass planets rather, we've already imaged some, mm -hmm. but we'll start to be able to image potentially habitable zone planets. So Proxima Centauri B, for instance, um, may be imageable with, for instance, the European Extremely Large Telescope and the METIS instrument. But you have to have, you have to literally, because Proxima Centauri B is probably within 40 milli arc seconds of its star, so incredibly close in. You need to have on order of 30, 40 meter telescope and diffraction limited, perfect you know, resolution. And so where you can start learning more is by looking at that dot of light at different wavelengths. So even just in a couple of different filters, sometimes you can learn a lot from that, but what's even more powerful is when you can get a spectrum. Mm -hmm which is essentially just is the dot of light at different wavelengths, just small wavelengths. Lengths. Well, the obvious technical answer is we listen to space using telescopes. That's more of the astronomer's line of work, although I must confess I have a particular love for radio telescopes myself, which is why I like to hang out in radio astronomy observatories. It's partly to understand how the science is done, but also partly because telescopes are really cool. That's Catherine Denning, an anthropologist at York University in Toronto who studies space. And she thinks that no matter how cool telescopes are, listening to space is mostly a way to look deeper into our lives here on Earth. In terms of, in my own work, how we, quote, listen to space, um, if we're thinking from the anthropological perspective, I would say that even before we dreamed of the technology necessary to see to the edge of time or hear to the edge of time, depends on how you like to characterize your electromagnetic waves, we've always been listening to space. We, human beings, we, obviously, the sky is very present for us. It's dark, the stars are bright, particularly so before the advent of light pollution. And we project our own imagination out there. We listen to the stories that are kind of reflected back to us in a way from space. So it's really been, I think, a, a big part of our, our consciousness um, ever since we started having abstract thought of any kind, perhaps even before that. So in terms of how we listen to space and anthropology, it's a question of listening to all the stories that are told about space and listening to its presence in our culture. This has been Transmission Podcast, hosted by Cecilia Lynn Jacobs and produced by Ian Garrett and Kate Leidenheim. With special thanks to today's guests, Aaron Zimmerman, Pippa Goldschmitz, Beth Diller, Dan Tamayo, Seth Shostak, Catherine Garcia-Sage, Catherine Denning, Avi Loeb, Pete Warden. Original composition and sound editing by Miles Avery. 
Transmission is a podcast and performance series speculating on what might happen if we began to receive the popular broadcasts of intelligent alien life, and follows two sisters selected to lead an interstellar mission to make first contact. We hope you enjoyed listening to us. Thank you.